Blow Up Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 121 of Real Blend, a podcast that knows a little bit more about Zack Snyder's Justice League than we did last week. Uh, my name is Sean O'Connell, the managing director here at Cinema Blend, and I am joined this week, as always, by the amazing Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hi, Kev. How are you doing? Sean, Jake, Gabe, good afternoon. Ten Hepathen, still <laughs> July 17th. He's still alive for its uh, palindrome title. And uh, the other man in the third chair. Sorry, uh, <laughs> we were going to have Gabe for a fourth chair, and that's why I'm a little bit thrown off. But we have Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hi, Jakey. How are you? Sorry, we've only done this 121 times. Why would you yes, have it down by now? I know. Episode highlights. Uh, we are going to be getting to movie theaters, uh, setting their plans to open uh, the Five Bloods. The Five Bloods is coming to Netflix on June 12th. It's a huge weekend for movies, for new movies to finally talk about. Uh, we have a guest. <laughs> Sir Kenneth Branagh is joining the show. Sir Kenneth Branagh is joining the show to talk about Artemis Fowl. And of course, while we had him, we had to get into his work on Tenant. Uh, we talked about the evolution of Thor. We picked his brain about uh, the filming of Death on the Nile, uh, his return to the Agatha Christie world. Um, but uh, a lot to get to in this show, and so we're really happy to be back. Guys, um, what have you been doing uh, this past week? Catch me up on how, how both of you guys are doing, because I've missed you a little bit. Uh, I've been doing, uh, I've been kind of doing these, like, marathons. Uh, every weekend I pick a, a theme or uh, some sort of cinematic artist, a lot of times a director, and kind of pick, and obviously not. I don't have time to do in the, in the entire filmography, um, but pick three or four Usually movies that either I've never seen or maybe just ones I want, want to re revisit. i um, been having a lot of fun doing that. And uh, I recently, uh, this past weekend, did the films of Spike Lee. So I rewatched 25th Hour. Uh, nice. re Because I just watched The Five Bloods. I rewatched Do the Right Thing. Um, just felt like a really uh, important time to revisit his work, which is as relevant today as it's ever been. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was nice to revisit. And I'm such a massive fan of of uh of 25th hour and i hadn't seen that in a few years so it was cool to revisit that kev you're doing something similar with apatow aren't you yeah well i've been it's interesting like i've been going through uh a bunch of different phases in regards to filmmakers i revisited some hitchcock films i think we discussed it a couple weeks ago i revisited vertigo and i watched nolan's first movie following but since we did the last show i re i actually finally saw the film the third man which is interesting that we have Kenneth Branagh on today because Kenneth Branagh directed Thor and Thor 1 had a lot of those canted Dutch angles and the yeah. third man's very well known for that. Uh, if anybody out there hasn't seen it, it's an older film, 1949, I believe. It's actually a recommendation that was given to me uh, by Jeremy Theobald, who was the lead star of Following, who was mentioning movies that he had watched uh, during his childhood or growing up. And he said, The Third Man. And I'm like, I've never seen The Third Man. He goes, wait, you've never seen The Third Man? I'm like... Well, now I need to watch the third man. So I watch it and, you know, I'd always heard about it and seen, uh, you know, frames from it. But I, I, I didn't really know much about it. Joseph Cotton, Orson Welles. I mean, it is truly a remarkable film from just a filmmaking standpoint, also a storytelling standpoint. Um, highly recommended. Orson Welles is iconic in the film. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if people who haven't seen it, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched that. Uh, Apatow, I've been watching. I rewatched all of Apatow's films. Uh, after the King of Staten Island, which we're going to review today, I watched Funny People again, 40 year old virgin knocked up. This is 40. Uh, am I missing one train wreck? Train wreck. All, all, by the way, shot on 35 millimeter film, which I thought was really cool. And I thought the timely nature of seeing those films on my on a big screen, but still shot 35. It gave them a very timeless feel versus a digital comedy. We, we see a lot of comedy shot, shot digitally, but I like that Apatow shoots film. And all a, 30 minutes longer than they needed to be. I don't <laughs> mind his, I don't mind the length of his movies. I don't mind that. I, uh, I'm just going to throw it back to Joseph Cotton for a second, you know, cause Ugh. we're a really relevant podcast. Uh, that man's credits are unbelievably great. Uh, and I know people might not understand who he is necessarily. Please take the time to just go back. I mean, obviously he was in Citizen Kane. He was in Magnificent Ambersons. He's in probably one of my favorite Hitchcock films. That's not the North by Northwest and Psychos of the World, which is Shadow of a Doubt, where he plays Uncle Charlie. Uh, just a terrific actor. Uh, later on, he got into a uh, Kevin mentioned the third man. I want to go back and Have you not seen through. the third man, Sean? No, I've seen it. I got to I've watch it in it. film class. We saw Jake. it in college. 
I've never Honestly, seen it. Honestly, it's one of those movies that I wish I saw in college because mm. I remember like I remember I do the right thing and Citizen Kane. I remember seeing in the same class. Oh, wow. Um, and I remember I, I bring those two up because I remember them very vividly. But the third man, I think the reason why I'm making that jump is because Citizen Kane had Orson Welles directing and starring. And Orson Welles is also in the third man. The third man felt like a movie I should have watched in college and yeah. studied the canted angles and the Dutch angles. But uh, I'm so happy I revisited now at my age or where I'm th- I'm 36 now. I don't know if I would have appreciated the film when I was in college or younger. So I'm actually glad I watched it when I did. And now I understand how much influence it had. So all right, that's cool. plugs. Let me get to some plugs. Uh, a reminder, we have a community page over on Facebook and it's been so much fun. OK, so if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, you'll see that all three of us are wearing all four of us. Gabe's Gabe, uh, Gabe, you don't have a camera on you, though, do you? Not necessarily. All four of us, trust me, are wearing our Real Blend T-shirts, which we made for uh, an amazing cause for a charity. We were raising uh, money for the Will Rogers Foundation. You guys were incredible. You guys have been uh, so we generated. I want to say it was fifteen hundred dollars, a little bit north of fifteen hundred dollars, and sold um, over a hundred shirts. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but what we asked for was for people to send us photographs of you guys wearing them. And it's been so cool to see the amount of uh, cool photographs coming in because a lot of you have gone out to movie theaters in your town to stand in front of them. And since this whole initiative was driven by the idea of helping movie theater employees and just celebrating the fact that we as a podcast love the movie going experience, it's been great to see you guys uh, do that. We had our Chicago family. Uh, They all went camping in Wisconsin and posed together in their real blend shirts. And we've just seen some really great responses from people who took the time to do it. Um, I don't know if I can announce this or not, but I'll mention that we uh, gave a saying no. <laughs> saying I, I don't even know what it is that not, you can't announce. Not announce it, but like at least just talk about the fact that we're having conversations about. We, well, so we're, we're getting closer to having a store uh, that people who missed the opportunity to pick up this shirt. Now, you won't be able to get this design because we are going to hold on to the fact that it's a limited edition shirt. And for the people who who got it at that time, are going to get this design. But we are going to have real blend stuff. Because we're getting really great feedback from people who say, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the shirt or I couldn't get the shirt at that time. Um, and we're we're working really hard behind the scenes to get some sort of real blend merch available to people who are interested in it. So that's coming. But um, follow along on the Facebook community page. because A lot of that stuff gets uh, dropped there. The Cinema Blend YouTube channel also has um, the show to stream. And again, you can sort of watch us here if you're doing that. We're also doing a really good job or a better job of pulling out uh, segments from that show. And we're going to start isolating some of our interviews from that show. We do some of that already. So there's all different ways that you'll be able to uh, digest the the longer show in its entirety or segments from it. So a really good way for you to uh, share it with friends too. the the clips that go up to YouTube uh, backslash cinema blend. And of course, the show is available where you get all of your podcasts uh, downloaded on a regular basis. So please keep up with the show on on a normal basis. I also want to point out that Cinema Blend this week uh, launched a new segment on our homepage and it's called Voices. And you can go to it right now and start to read some of the original content that we are dropping in the Voices segment. Um, It is going to be on the front page. It's not leaving the front page. Uh, In this Voices section, Cinema Blend is going to seek to provide a place to highlight and amplify projects that are created by uh, people of color and or created by people of color uh, and in other historically underrepresented communities. And it's something that we wanted to do to not just throw our support behind the current push for Black Lives Matter, uh, but to really go one step further and and to keep a continuous spotlight on storytellers who uh, are notoriously um, what's the opposite of amplified? <laughs> Not that they're necessarily held down, but they, they aren't given as large of a showcase as I think that we feel that they deserve. And so that's going to bleed over into Real Blend as well, too. We are making a stronger push to shine a brighter light on filmmakers of color, on creators of uh, from misrepresented or underrepresented uh, communities, too. So um, we want to hear from you guys as well, too, because our audience comes from all corners. And we've been so proud and and happy to meet so many different people who come from so many diverse backgrounds who listen to the show. And so we want to hear back from you guys, too, uh, through some feedback about people that you might want us to try to interview or films that we might want to try to review on the show or just spread the word about. So um, it's something that you can see on Cinema Blend's YouTube, uh, uh, Cinema Blend's homepage. And then it's an initiative that we would like to launch here on the show. And Gabe wants to talk a little bit more about it to further explain a little bit what we're trying to get into. 
No, no, you pretty much covered it. I, I think for us as a show, I speak for all of us that we're really proud of the fact that our audience is so colorful, is so different because we all kind of revolve around the idea that we love movies uh, and that's kind of it. And it doesn't really, nothing else really matters um, as far as the prerequisite needed to, you know, enjoy the show. So just to further that, you know, there's the email address, realblend at cinemablend.com. There's all of us on Twitter. Uh, you know, send us your thoughts. You know, it's not just us that, you know, can solve that problem or figure out the best ways uh, to move this initiative forward. So, so let us know, you know, you we want your voices to be heard as well. And that'll help us, um, you know, kind of make these steps as we go. So thank you guys for listening as always. And, and, and thank you guys for your feedback in advance. Uh, that helps us make this a better show. Absolutely. Yeah. So cool. from here on out, we're just going to be listening. Uh, you know, we want to hear more feedback from you guys and it'll help us sort of drive the, the initiative forward as we continue to expand and see different ways that we can spotlight all different types of films from all different types of storytellers. So uh, weekly poll, let's jump to that right now because we did June movies two weeks ago <laughs> and uh, we didn't do a poll last week because we knew we weren't going to have a show, but we asked you guys what movies you were most looking forward to covering uh, or hearing about in June and potentially watching him with June 12th coming up uh, being the first real weekend, having a lot of big movies to choose from. Here are the ones that you had. Uh, the Five Bloods, The King of Staten Island, Artemis Fowl, or then Other. Uh, and we asked, tell us below what it was going to be. Uh, we got over 100 votes. I'm going to ask Kevin to tell me uh, what he thinks led the poll, whether it's the new Spike Lee, the new Judd Apatow, or the new Sir Kenneth Branagh. Uh, it's so it's, it's so interesting because like they, there's totally different audiences that yeah. are watched like, you know, Artemis Fowl could be a family audience. Um, I'm going to vote just purely based on which one I think is the best of the three. And I'm going to say Def Defy Bloods. All right, Jake. Any I guess? would say I would say the same thing just because I feel like people. So, I mean, Spike Lee is one of those filmmakers that I feel like doesn't really matter what he puts out. He puts out a new film. People are going to want to see it. Right. Um, and I can't think of like what would fall under the other umbrella unless I'm missing something big. Um, I don't feel like there's a ton of traction right now for Staten Island or at least when the poll was happening. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think because of that reasoning, I think I'm going to go with Defy Bloods. Well, Spike got close, but he got second place. <laughs> to what? <laughs> it was Apatow. It's Apatow. The King really? of Staten Island got 44%. Uh, Defy Bloods got 38.5% and Artemis Fowl pulled in 10. And I think a lot of it is Pete Davidson. I think people uh, are really curious to see what he's going to be like as a leading man. Uh, I know this comedy is very much geared towards who he is, and we're going to review it later on in the show. Um, but I have heard a lot of people sort of ask me questions about him uh, and him in the movie uh, in, a, in a way almost that like when Amy Schumer and John Apatow did Trainwreck, like a lot of the, the spotlight fell on her. And how is she going to translate into a leading role type thing? So um, we'll, we'll talk about King of Staten Island in a minute. I know Artemis Fowl only got 10 percent, but I want to throw it to our interview this week, which is Sir Kenneth Branagh, the director of Artemis Fowl. Is and he the first sir that we've had on the show? I believe so. Yes. Uh, I mean, Quentin's kind of a sir, right? Yeah. <laughs> sir Quentin Tarantino. Uh, we will knight him that way. Uh, the thing about Kenneth Branagh is so I've learned a lesson uh, in social media <laughs> this week in that I put up a tease on our Real Blend uh, channel that just said, like, we've got a huge interview, like, as I'm so excited for Kenneth Branagh. And then everybody started guessing and they were like, oh, it's Spike Lee. Oh, it's Chris Nolan. <laughs> and I texted Gabe and I was like, oh, man, my my stupid tweet is going to make people mildly disappointed that we got Sir Kenneth Branagh <laughs> on the show. But it also speaks to the idea that people are not phased by the, the concept that we might have Spike Lee or Chris yeah, Nolan. Kenneth Braun is a big guest. Oh, my God, yeah. dude. It's hey, enormous. Yeah, but I know what Sean's saying. It's like people just assume we're going to get Nolan or Spike Lee. I'm like, yeah. you know, Nolan is still that that one we haven't caught yet. Like, <laughs> that, 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 I, I don't know that we're going to catch Nolan. I have right. no idea. But I mean. But it, it, like, so like, I think what Sean's saying is that like it, it's complimentary to us that you would assume yes that it's going to be Nolan. Uh, but I just hope you all know that when this show started, yeah, or Spike Lee. <laughs> but when this show started, having Kenneth Braun on the show would have been like, like impossible. <laughs> That would have felt impossible. <laughs> right, so right, it's a big right. deal. It is a huge deal. And uh, I think you're going to understand that this is a really fun interview and a really entertaining interview. He's incredibly intelligent. He's a really gifted filmmaker. And we are thrilled to have Kenneth Branagh on the Real Blend podcast uh, doing an interview on behalf of his upcoming Disney Plus film, Artemis Fowl. 
We were uh, lucky enough to send someone to the Artemis Fowl set in the UK, and, and they came back. It wasn't me personally, but um, they came back raving about the construction of Fowl Manor uh, and the amount of work that went into building that. And it got me wondering why you, um, as a director, prefer to push for the use of practical effects and, and sets and locations as often as possible when technology kind of makes it easier for you to just paint in what you would like to see. Well, it makes it different. I think it's something for me. Sometimes it doesn't make it easier, but it does make it different. And sometimes it's quicker, and sometimes it's not. But uh, I love on film, particularly because if you shoot on film, you know you've got shorter periods in which you can shoot. You you mount a magazine; it might be uh, ten minutes long. It isn't, you know, the half hour, forty minutes you might get if you're shooting on on digital. Uh, so that becomes a ritual. And then if you can create in that excitement, um, every other kind of excitement, so that the, the on the set it feels like particularly for movies like this, you know, where you have uh, big visual effects and things, if you can create a sense of um, event or about every kind of scene where it, where the goal is not people like me saying, so the troll's going to be 20 foot high, instead having some massive troll really chasing um, our real actors around the house. There's just something about what it does to the atmosphere with the actors and to the crew and everything where maybe... Um, Something that I like to retain in these film adventures is just that unexpected happening, which which is there when when it is not too technically dominated. It's not to say I don't revere and embrace every kind of technological advance, but if some of what you're doing is after that sort of human frailty, that human imperfection, that human excitement, sometimes mistakes, happy mistakes made when excitements are there. It comes out of them, in this case, a Ferdy Ashore being taken onto the set for the first time, and like in that beautiful bookcase behind you, having him walk up to that and see that all the books in there are all the ones that he selected when we rehearsed six months ago. And and every sort of detail of the room, he already sort of owns. I saw his face light up as if, if he was a vessel, I could have seen it being filled with more of his character. By the time that encounter with that real set, not that piece of blue screen, had really significantly affected the way he was going to play this part. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm assuming this extends to uh, the Karnak that we'll be seeing uh, later on this year as well, too. Yeah, yeah. We we, 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 <laughs> we built it and we took people out on the water and we went to Egypt and we we, we mixed up every kind of um, possibility. And yeah, the very first day, for me, it was important. Get real actors, all 12 of them, all 12 of our leading suspects from Miss Gaddo all the way down to Miss Wright. Um, and get and get them on a real boat in real water in the sunshine. It was a really great bonding thing. We were on a little launch as they went to go board the massive big Karnak, uh, and it was um, already that the central thing you want to get in those kind of movies is the excitement of the holiday, of the global trip, of the great sort of travelogue movie. And we, you know, we had it on day one because people were slightly scared, frankly, of falling in. Um, <laughs> that's, what I'd, that's what I'd call that kind of happy human excitement. You can't replicate that anywhere else, that's for sure. Uh, you have uh, familiar and very trusted faces uh, to help you carry along the Artemis Fowl narrative, whether it be uh, Josh Gad or, or Dame Judi Dench. Um, but, you know, the story obviously rests on the shoulders of whoever you cast as Artemis. And so I, I wanted to know what characteristics you were most looking for uh, before you found Ferdi Ashaw. Uh, you needed a good thinker, someone who on screen could convey intelligence and a fast moving mind. Artemis Fowl is quick, quick, quick. He has to keep up with the pace of events in a really exhilarating story where fairies much more advanced than him technologically have to be caught up with. So a fast thinker, someone with a permanent sense of humor, um, and uh, across the nine months that we auditioned Ferdy Ashore amongst the other 1,200 boys that we saw in, in, in Ireland, uh, I saw a sense of humor retained, a sense of fascination retained, wonder retained and uh, real passion about the books. So um, he, he also, he felt as though with every single audition, he was absorbing more, makes films himself now, Ferdy is smart as a nut. So really? uh, yeah, it felt like we, yeah, this guy, I mean, you, you know, he was like, he was overtaking me in terms of the capacity to direct films uh, <laughs> within about a week. So I'm, I'm very, in about a year or so, I'm very much looking forward to auditioning for Ferdia in, as, he, <laughs> as he shoots Artemis 2. <laughs> was he shadowing you on set and absorbing as much as he could? He was always, always questioning why we did things from a you know, position of pure joy. He loved it. He, he loved the action part of it. So he loved joining in. 
Um, always asking questions technically about the cameras, difference between film and digital. Uh, what what elements of a blue screen shot would be shot in camera? Which would be elements? Which would be just against a, a blue screen itself? He he was um, yeah like Lara McDonald who plays Holly Short. They were both very very um, passionately interested in the process uh, as well as losing themselves as characters in the in the story. So it didn't detach them from what we were doing, but they were phenomenally sort of hungry, really hungry. And uh, I've no doubt both of them, uh, Lara a year later came and did her work experience with us. Two weeks, she was she went through every department on Death on the Nile. So one day she was taking the stills, the next day she was doing the clapperboard. And between her and Ferdia, I mean, they know their way around a film set now with a sort of depth of knowledge that I would have killed for at that age. Sure, what a gift, absolutely. Um, I'm glad you mentioned getting lost in the process of it. We're a fi- uh, film podcast that obviously loves to get into the the intricacies of the of the uh, production and uh, uh, there's a, a sequence in your film that I thoroughly enjoyed and I just want to know if there's a trick to filming a time freeze or if it's as simple as just having the the guests at a wedding stand perfectly still for a long period of time while you move your camera through them. Well, you know, it's both what we did do. We we work a lot with a choreographer, Rob Ashford, both in the theater and he did the choreography on Disney Cinderella. For this one, a central group of our Italian villagers were fantastic dancers, and all the dancers who had to freeze to begin the visual effects from a real place uh, were ones who were, for weeks ahead, were trained in being still in the most exaggerated positions. Plus, once we worked out what they were, we hung some of them by wires as well, but we made sure that physically the people who are going to be in the most sort of uh, strung out kind of uh, contortions would be dancers. So the trick was to add a really premeditated choreographic element. That's outstanding. Um, my name is Sean O'Connell. Obviously, uh, my family hails from County Cork. I would be in hot water if I didn't ask why you altered the traditional Irish blessing. Uh, there's a, a line at the end that goes in a different direction. I was curious to get your insight. Uh, well, there was, a, it, there was a straw poll taken amongst all the Irish people there, and they, they felt that the, the, the greatest universality would be had by the version that we have in the, in the story. So it was with respect for the original and for all other versions of it. Um, but uh, that, that's the conclusion we came to in, in the 21st century. It's amazing to hear a, a passage of dialogue and just, you know, it's something that's so ingrained. You know, once you start to hear it, you're like, oh, it's almost like a, a warm, comforting blanket wrapped around you as someone who's grown up Irish. Yeah, same here. Well, I have to say, I mean, it was on a, it was on a tea towel uh, that was hung up on our kitchen wall growing up. So I literally saw that blessing writ large on the wall of my mother's tiny kitchen. So she believed in it. Absolutely. Uh, to to a, a certain extent, I feel that the film is a bit of a love letter to Irish storytelling as well, too. So that passion comes through uh, in the frames. We are, uh, as a film going community, desperate to get back to movie theaters. And again, this podcast champions uh, the theater going experience. We have been holding out hope for Tenet uh, to be the film that that ushers us back. So first and foremost, please spill every secret that you can about the Nolan film. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, I want to know if it's important for you to be part of a movie that, you know, if schedules hold, might be the first global release that issues people back. Sean, I'm in a darkened room here because outside are uh, Chris Nolan guards who, if I'm if I say anything out untoward, they'll burst in here and they'll drag me out. They'll hang me upside down outside the Long Cross Studios. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of the movie. It's a fantastic screenplay by Chris Nolan. It, it is all of his obsessions, all of his preoccupations. It is part of a, a, a sort of continuity that goes all the way from the following, frankly, through Memento, definitely through Inception and Interstellar. There is a, um, a kind of engagement with time uh, that I think um, is incredibly playful in 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 um, in a, the, the international espionage thriller genre, and he takes that to the most epic uh, dimension. Seven continents of uh, of action. The casting is very very strong, and it had it had this. It, it felt like the biggest movie ever being made in an auteur style, like it was a sort of cottage industry with all his key department heads um, doing it really, really everybody up to speed knowing this was very special. Now, of course, yes, I think everybody would love it to be the picture that we come back to the movies with, I think, because it celebrates what the boldest and bravest movie making can be. Images designed for a big screen, designed for a communal audience to enjoy 
where part of the experience is the group experience to that kind of story. Um, if ever any picture had a chance of, of flying back with a, fla- with, a, with a flag raised saying, isn't cinema great? I, I'd like to think this one is. As someone who's lucky enough to transition back and forth between acting and directing um, multiple times when you get a chance, are you still at this point, you know, learning important lessons about how to tell stories and, and how to direct when you are able to work with other filmmakers? I think learning more and more, it was a, it was a real eye opener once again to work with Chris Nolan. The first thing you you engage with is the the power of concentration and refinement. It seems to me that most artists, as they get older and get better, you know, refine more. They do less. They do. They concentrate. They make essential what it is that they do. So seeing him, I often compare him to sportsmen who can. Um, create a sense of a different time. He's on matrix time in the minute, in the middle of a sort of, uh, sort of sandstorm of, of activity and chaos, I mean, literally in, in Dunkirk, weather, huge boats, huge planes, a few thousand people. And somehow if you had a dialogue moment, even a beat in a moment that involved a huge piece of action, his ability to almost create a kind of um, oasis of calm in that storm in order to give that, that moment the attention it deserved it was he was going to give that moment the attention it deserved as well but his ability to in his own right sort of manipulate creative and artistic time is amazing so watching that even just watching that being near that it was an inspiration so yeah i learn every day is a school day no question you uh, take on a device that i find to be um sometimes challenging in that movie movies use it uh to their advantage and sometimes to their disadvantage which is the use of a narrator uh, Josh Gad being the narrator that takes uh, the audiences through art. Now, there's a lot of story that needs to to be digested by the audience. So I'm just curious about your decision to set the structure of the film up that way and to even cut away to black and white. Why did you use black and white when you were using him as his, his interview? Uh, well, partly because we wanted to set up this other layer of, of sort of conspiracy that somehow he's being watched and, and, and suggesting in the audience's mind that there may be, you know, several you know, layers of intrigue to uncover before you understand what the real truth is. Is he speaking in the here and now? Is he in some future? Is he in some past? And um, the books themselves, the very first book um, uh, has, a, has, a, has an account of the Artemis Fowl story by a Professor J.A. Argon, mm-hmm. Professor Jargon, as it were. And uh, so that, that as a kind of part of Owen's use of this genre was already sort of established there that this was in itself, it's an example of, of an Irish tall tale. And so the idea that you offer up a storyteller for such a, for such a tale, I think is, uh, is an important one, particularly in tall tales, no more unreliable narrator than Mulch Diggums in the form of Josh Gad could perhaps be imagined. I would also love to know, and I know fans of the book would like to know, the conversations that went into the creation of the Oculus when we are finally able to see it. Um, is it pulled directly from the narr- their narration in the book? No. this I mean, this was one of the reasons why Owen Colfer was such a great um, uh, collaborator, because we, about halfway through the process of developing the script with a great Irish uh, screenwriter, Conor McPherson, a playwright and screenwriter, uh, felt as though we needed something that was... Um, uh, uh, you know, the lost ark, uh, some totemic symbol that was uh, the power of the fairy world, which when in the wrong hands could endanger both fairies and humans. Um, And so he he was was the one who allowed us to have the license to go straight to uh, the Latin name for acorn, uh, which was very much in our vernacular. So the ways to find the name of that and the kind of thing it was, we went via his books, but he allowed that to be something which he agreed and we felt was right for a, a, mo- a movie uh, experience here to give that that sort of um, uh, that holy grail that they, all the characters were looking for. Fantastic. Um, I'll get you out of here on this one. I know we're running out of time. If you can see over my shoulder, uh, there are posters for the last two Avengers films. I'm a Marvel kid and I adored what you did with Thor. Um, I'm curious if you've kept track of his his path and his evolution. And, uh, you know, if you put Thor Ragnarok up against your original Thor, it, it seems like he's grown so much. And I'm curious if you were surprised at, at how you could take <clears throat> that character, but also Chris Hemsworth, you know, as, as you're responsible for sort of bringing him into the MCU, uh, that he has the capability to stretch and grow and, and, and come up with completely different films like that. Well, anybody who uh, went back to the comics, as I did when I approached it, most people would, would see that across all the kind of story arcs, um, 
they are so various. They are so extraordinary, every kind, including what we may well see in Thor 4 with Miss Portman and her possible embodiment of uh, said superhero in, you know, in female form, uh, as per some early, you know, recent sort of story arcs. So the materials variety was already in the DNA, but it needed people who could come and seize that opportunity. And it wasn't just filmmakers, it was also audiences. Audiences needed to be ready to go on those wild rides. And um, uh, so they did. And and so, um, you know, Mr. Mims, Mr. Hemsworth has been able to uh, tick the box with, uh, you know, Tom Hiddleston saying memorably, memorably and teasingly, it's it's amazing how, how across the Thor movies, uh, Thor has got to look more and more like Chris Hemsworth. Um, <laughs> He said, I think that's born out of how long it took to put that that blonde wig on in the first one. <laughs> Very true. Uh, well, as a father uh, and as the husband of an elementary school teacher, I thank you for allowing Artemis Fowl to, to come to Disney+. Plus. I know the families are really uh, anxious to see it, and, and they're looking for original content, and, and so this is a great opportunity for them. I hope we're back in theaters by the time Niall rolls around. I know that it seems like we're you know wanting to see that on the biggest screen possible, and, uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to to join me, Mr. Brana. And I'm so glad to hear that about, about audiences. We, we're, we're glad to be getting this to people at a time when, you know, the, the world can do with, you know, something like this as a distraction in the middle of all the noise and haste. It, you know, it ain't much, but it's definitely something. It's fantastic escapism, that's for sure. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Uh, so we're recording the show right now. And as you guys know, I'm the only one who was able to do the interview. Uh, they did it really early uh, on East Coast time because Kenneth Branagh was in London and the boys were both on their respective news program. So I had to handle this one. Um, but I cannot wait because at this point now, while we're recording it, Kevin has not heard the audio yet. And I really want him to hear all those cool things that Brana shared about uh, Dun- working on Dunkirk and working with Nolan and the amount of things that he learns from Nolan, like, I, you know, we talked about, as you just heard, you know, being an actor and a director, how much he absorbs from other filmmakers. And uh, it was just so much. And of course, whenever we interview somebody who has worked with Nolan, like my personal goal is just to get them to say the word Dunkirk. <laughs> right. I would you like said a we montage. We have four people now that, that have at said At least it? that I can think of. Yes. Who, um, who, so Damien Chazelle said it on our show. Tarantino yeah. said it. Kenneth right. Branagh said it. And, and Sam Mendes said it also. <laughs> yeah. Mendes, well, Mendes says also. Dunkirk. Dunkirk. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of fun with like a Damien or a Mendes when, when you don't anticipate them yeah. saying it. <laughs> and and we, have, we all have, I feel like we all have to keep our cool because anytime anyone says it, we, I feel like we all like look at each other like guys you know, you just said, you well know, it's you just also said. like why like damien chazelle says it we can't be like oh my god yeah. thank and, yeah, we, you. we all can't like start giggling like just because he says dunkirk <laughs> yeah and he said it so randomly he's like i just revisited dunkirk the other day <laughs> oh it's awesome uh let's get to news uh in our talking points and i want to throw it to the bill and ted trailer um so this is bill and ted face the music the other day was uh the self-proclaimed holiday bill and ted day <laughs> because they had a movie to promote. Um, this is a movie that's uh, allegedly coming out in August. It's a little bit strange that the end of the trailer didn't have a release date on it. Um, pulling that sort of, you know, tenant safety net of just in case things aren't where we need them to be, but it's coming at the end of August. I, I think I'm, I'm a little more with Kevin in this one in that I thought it looked OK, but I was a little bit disappointed in it for a couple of reasons. One, I thought it was too short, um, like just as well, it was starting it was to get going, it tailed than... off. Yeah. And then something about Keanu Reeves in it makes me I just got a vibe that he didn't want to be there. Yes. And I feel really bad about about coming to that conclusion. Me too. Yeah. You saw that. It kind too? of it disappointed me. It kind of just it kind of disappointed me, to be honest. It was like I was watching it. and I'm like, this just seems it feels like it to me. It felt like Keanu Reeves was on SNL doing a replaying (sighs) the Bill and Ted characters for a joke. That's how it felt to me when he appeared. And also it was really CG heavy. I'm just wondering if the CG was even finished. Certain elements looked strange. I think Sean, you and I were were talking about his facial hair, right? And how different uh, he looks without a beard. Was that you and I talking about that? And I agree with you. It does. It was, it was almost like seeing uh, Henry Cavill with the digitally removed mustache <laughs> oh, no. in Justice League. Oh, no. And I'm not saying his beard was digitally removed. It just looked like it from the trailer. Now, sure. keep in mind, 
trailers happen all the time with effects not finished. It is a common thing. I still don't understand why studios would ever release this trailer unfinished. I don't know that this one definitely is unfinished, but we've heard of this before. We've seen trailers come out and say, oh, the effects weren't done. We're going to fix it. Or, oh, that shot's not going to be in the movie. We're taking it out, even though it's in the trailer kind of thing. My point, though, is this just felt forced to me. The whole thing just felt like they were doing it kind of more for a paycheck based on the trailer. Now, I have no idea. The movie could be outstanding. The trailer was a letdown for me. All right, I'll throw it under the bus for just one more th- opportunity, and then I'll throw it to Jake, who I think liked it more than, than you and I did. If you're bringing back the concept of Bill and Ted, and you're like, hey, we've got a script, it's going to be amazing. Uh, this is the reason to bring these two back after such a long period of time. And then it's like, well, on the first movie, they went back to the past. So a hacky screenwriter thing would be like, well, let's send them into the future. And when the big reveal for this trailer That's was... That's literally back to the future, to too. the future... Right. But but Back to the Future only did that for like 30 minutes, 30 something. And maybe maybe this movie only does it for a short amount of time. I really do hope that it expands out to other things, because if the only plot is they go to the future, then it's going to be a little bit a little bit disappointing. One thing I'll say before we get to Jake is that I, you know, the, I love the idea. Don't they have to write a metal song to yeah. save the world? It's, it's like, almost like, so, like that. Um, yes. that Tenacious like, D. Tenacious song? D. Yeah. Yeah. The tribute. Yes. Which I, is which you've never heard that song. It's basically a song about how they <laughs> ran into a demon and the demon says, we're going to destroy the world unless you create the greatest song of all time. Now the yeah. hook is they can't remember what the song is that they wrote, but it was really, really good. And yeah. this song is a tribute to that song, even though they can no longer remember what that song was. And it, tribute's it, a great song. It's a great, it's a great song. <laughs> I actually <laughs> saw I saw uh, Jack Black and Kyle Gass uh, on a plane one time. I was walking back to coach. They were in first class. And I pointed to them and I said, tribute is the greatest song of all time. And I kid you not, Kyle Gass looks up and goes, no, it's not. It's just a tribute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. That's great. Fun fact. Do you, do you guys know who plays the demon in tribute? Is, is it Dave Grohl? Is it? Oh, I, I think is it it's Dave, Dave Grohl? Grohl. I thought it was Tim Curry. Dave Grohl. It's Dave Grohl. Yeah, Dave Grohl plays a uh, large backstory as Dave Grohl is like one of the people that discovered Tenacious D yeah. doing their comedy and kind of got them, uh, you know, recording and all that stuff. Yeah. But it all even in uh, The Pick of Destiny, Dave Grohl plays like the devil or a demon in all their yeah. all their work. That's, That's pretty awesome. great. That's awesome. Was, was Tim Curry out? ever the devil or am I thinking of something completely different? Uh, Tim Curry was the devil in something, but I can't think of what it was. Yeah. Anybody out there who hasn't seen The Pick of Destiny, please do it. One thing I'm so bummed about was when that movie came out, I loved it. I remember giving it like five out of five because it was everything I loved about movies. It was comedy. It was heavy metal. And it was it was just really well done storytelling. I thought it was it's a genuinely good film. Um, But they gave away these green Pick of Destiny picks uh, with that movie promotion. And I had one and I remember loving it and using it and I can't find it. And now I'm just so upset that I didn't (laughs) hold hold on to it because it was a really cool movie promotion. We have so many movie promotion things all over our houses. That's one I wish I would have kept. I really do. Look at the size of this pick. That That, came with one of Brendan's uh, uh, kid acoustic guitars, and I hold on to it because it's comically large. (laughs) Weirdly enough, that's how the Pick a Destiny pick was. It was like a it was one of the larger picks. Was it? really? It was one of like the Yeah, because I remember it being like because I use like super small jazz heavy picks for for my guitar playing. Mm -hmm. But this pick was like awesome. I saw Tenacious D on that tour. I think they toured that film. And I think Mars Volta might have opened for them. I remember going to that show at the Patriot Center in D.C., which is now, I think, the Eagle One Arena. I think it's what it's called now. But seeing them live was like watching the movie in person, even though it wasn't as like dramatic as all the visual effects. The energy they, those two put into a concert blew my mind. Yeah. It was such an amazing experience. If you haven't seen them, please see them and watch The Pick of Destiny. That's an underrated comedy. So, Jake, you adored this trailer and you, you love know, everything about the movie and can't wait for it no, to sweep well, okay. the Oscars. Ah, I, 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 I think just by comparison, I think I liked it more than you guys. I'll be the first person to admit that, like, it's not that I'm saying that I think it looks like a great movie off the trailer. I am a, um, a self-confessed sucker for nostalgia. Hmm. Um, I, but it's also an interesting thing where, like, I grew up on those movies and I remember loving those movies. But it's also been a long time since I've seen those movies. So, like... They might not even have the same effect on me that I remember them having when I grew up with them. Um, I like I, I it's interesting, though. I do, I do question 
whether or not, to your point about Keanu Reeves, it's not that I think he's not into it. My thing is, it just makes me wonder if these are characters that we really want to see grown up. Mm. I mean, he was like a kid, you know, and he had that, you know, I feel like that type of character lends itself to like being a kid, which he was when he made those. I'm Mm -hmm. just not sure that that type of character it seems authentic or is going to translate. Like I have a hard time believing he's going to be the same type of guy at 45 or 50 or however old he is. Like now, like in this one, they have kids now. I'm just not sure. Like it just doesn't seem real to me that they would be the exact two, like talking the exact same way and doing the same manner. Like I almost want to like see them a little bit different like right, older right, right. and then maybe when they're back together they slide back into it i don't know i'd like i feel like they have to address it like it's been a while and and the adults don't tend to act i mean like you know we're all different than we were you know at that age i feel like the the best comparison i can make to what jake just said which i think is interesting is imagine watching another wayne's world film mm. now mm-hmm. and I, I it would just be weird but also uh it's also the reason blues brothers 2000 didn't work you know what i mean it was weird i mean because yeah. remember who wait who came back for that Ackroyd, Ackroyd. Ackroyd did, and then john goodman played john not he didn't play belushi's character but yeah. it was like yeah a brother or a relative of some sort yeah so i feel like in that case just if you're if you're just solely looking at dan Aykroyd, it was still weird to see him revisit that character because yeah, i think sure. blues brothers is like one of the yeah. funniest movies of all time also how do you do it without belushi yeah, I, right that, it's one of those things where you start wondering okay where is the business decision where is the story decision now i mean don't get me wrong i i'm not trying to be like a debbie downer here about this movie i love keanu reeves i absolutely love everything he does i'm obsessed with him i actually don't like talking badly about anything he's in because I genuinely like the guy, but I mean, we are reviewers, we are critics, so we are always going to be critical and give our honest opinions. Um, by the way, underrated movie of his, Constantine. We'll get to that later. Oh, though. I love um, Constantine. But one Bill of the, and Ted, one of the best on-screen Satans ever, Peter Stormare. Yeah, an amazing movie. But I just found this trailer to be uninspired. Okay, but I want to. Okay, perfect for this reason. Keanu Reeves' most recent films. Not that he's not allowed to try different stuff, but John Wick Four. John Wick 3, Toy Story 4, A Matrix 4. Um, you know, does he feel like he's trapped a little bit in a loop? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm getting way hypothetical on this, but. It's an interesting question. You bring that up because where where is the line? Right. So, OK, we're all we're all in on Matrix 4. We all love John Wick 3. They keep getting better. Um, Toy Story 4 <laughs> was I thought Toy Story 4 kind of was on that line of like, eh, it's not his movie, but he's in it. Right, but it was like... And uh, he is great in that as the stuntman. Canadian he is very stuntman. good in that yeah, movie. He's funny in it. But, but I guess, I don't know, for me, I think Bill and Ted was the was where the line was like officially crossed. I'm like, this It could be, I mean, but it's also, you know, and this goes back to other conversations we've had. Like, this movie kind of came into existence because I felt like fans were asking for it for years. Mm-hmm. Same mm-hmm. thing with uh, Anchorman 2, and, and I'm going to think of other examples whenever the show ends. But I feel like it happens where... As fans, we keep asking them, like, oh, like, when are we going to get another sequel? And then we get it, and then we go, like, oh, yeah, we didn't really want that. You know who else was asking for it is Alex Winter. <laughs> because I think he needs some stuff well, to do. And listen, he, he looks like he's having fun. He does. This movie could be awesome. I hope You it never is. know. Sure. I, I, I want it to be awesome. I yes. think Pick a Destiny is probably the best comparison. That's exactly what it kind of That was seems pretty like. good. That was yeah. pretty good. All right, let's move on to a, a bigger topic and one that I think is going to generate some heated debate uh, which is theaters opening. So right before we started recording, uh, a couple of like two huge news uh, items broke that are feeding into this conversation. One is that California is contemplating or is actually going through with the process of reopening their theaters. You can open your theaters as of Friday, June 12th. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, all locations are going to do it. And I don't think that it is addressed what they would show if they're able to open, but I'm assuming it would be retro programming, essentially. Uh, Behind that uh, news that California was looking towards reopening is that AMC Theaters now plans for, quote unquote, almost all of their U.S. and British theaters to be open in July with NATO, uh, the North American. No. National Association, I was doing the other NATO, the National Association of Theater Owners saying 90 percent of overseas markets are going to be running again by mid-July via the New York Times. Now, that puts everybody uh, 
who cares about this show uh, on track for Tenet on July 17th. But it brings up the uh, question of are we ready as a society to go back to the movie theaters? And I'll go first by just saying that I would go back today uh, if we could. And I understand the the fears uh, and the the dangers that potentially come with it, the health, uh, the health problems that come with it. And I understand the theaters are going to have to figure out a way to uh, juggle audiences. And we're going to we don't know the sizes I hear. We hear 25 percent capacity in some theaters. And, um, and it's going to be like what a press screening feel like whenever you if that happens and you go to a theater with 25 sure. percent capacity, like you will know what it's like when kind of the three of us go see. Movies. But the, the reactions that I've been seeing on social media from people who seem really adamant uh, against the opening or just pointing out how ridiculous this seems right now, from what I've seen from my own personal sampling, have been people who are in New York and L.A., like friends of mine, colleagues who are in New York and L.A. And it's very possible or, or probable that the situations in their cities is far worse than it is here in Charlotte. Uh, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're, we are as close to back that as, as I can tell you, and it doesn't mean that our numbers aren't going up and it doesn't mean that we're still not being cautious and trying to practice social distancing, but our businesses are open. Like the only thing left that we can't do is eat in a restaurant uh, or go to a bar. Those are the last two things to, but as you can, if you're watching on the YouTube channel, I've gotten my hair cut. Uh, stores are opening and they're all figuring out ways to evolve and practice social distancing. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get to, not not ever. Uh, we're not close to doing live shows and concerts. That seems like a different hurdle to overcome. But theaters feel like that's a space that we can manipulate the way other businesses are manipulating to practice social distancing, to I think one thing that's tripping people up is that the theaters aren't requiring masks, that they're encouraging it, but it's not you have to wear one to get in. That's the one thing I would change. I would think if you if you really want to go to the movie theaters, you probably should have to wear a mask. And I would wear a mask if I were going to go to one. But I personally am ready. How about you guys? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm in. Um, I think uh, I think. Chicago being a little bit bigger city than Charlotte is probably a little bit behind the curve. Um, we just entered what is referred to as phase three out of five phases in terms of like the reopening process. Very pretty similar um, patios and stuff like that. Um, stores, not necessarily essential stores only. Um, but no, I, I think if theaters are taking the proper precautions mm -hmm. and especially if and obviously we'll get to this in a second, but like. If they're going to use every screen for tenant mm -hmm. and then because of that, have the luxury of only doing a 25 percent capacity, mm -hmm. which means we're talking like in theory, like multiple seats bet between people sure. and staggered between the people in front of you and people behind you. I, th I think that's that's a that's a fairly safe scenario. If everyone's kind of on the same page. I, I'm with you. I, I if 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 everyone's taking the right precautions and the CDC is saying, yeah, OK, you know, just just be safe about it. Why wouldn't I believe that? And Kevin, not to jump in on you, but one thing that assists that uh, is a technology that that was a, introduced for convenience, but is now almost essential, which is the ability to pick your seat before you go. Um, you know, that was a convenience. But now theaters have a much better way of policing how many people are in a theater and where they're sitting, whereas it used to be a free for all, right? Like you just went into a theater and you found available seats kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you can use that technology now to know when house number one has X amount of people for tenant, it's closed, you know, yeah. like we're not selling that house anymore. And I think that the theaters have the ability to keep a closer eye on something like that, which makes me feel safer about going back. Now, I have heard the argument about like, you don't know how air is circulated in theaters. It's essentially a dark room that you're sitting in for hours with a stranger. Um, but I just I, I don't know, like I'm not trying to minimalize the risks that come with COVID. And, and we're still answering a lot of questions about it. But it, it's to me feels like it's it's the right time to go back. Well, it's interesting because like there are certain things that are opening that I question as things that would be similar to a movie theater. If you go and I got my hair cut the other day in and now again, I'm not in a environment with 100 people, but I'm in an environment with 10 to 15 people. Mm -hmm. And we're not you know, there's no six feet apart. We're wearing masks. 
but where I still went in there and got my haircut. Mm. And, you know, I, and again, there's no I'm not minimalizing or comparing a haircut to a movie theater, but it's still a closed space with multiple people that are not six feet apart. Did you guys um, have to, um, sorry, I don't mean to like interrupt, but I, you, the only reason I bring this up is I'm literally leaving this show to go get my first haircut in months. You guys have done it. Uh, masks while you're I getting masks the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. all, all the guy did was it was really cool. Like he, um, he just lifts up like the part of your mask that you, that he wants to go under. And, and mm-hmm. then in between me, uh, and the next person were, were like, uh, plastic, uh, cool. barriers. Um, and, Honestly, I I didn't find it to be scary. Um, now, listen, I think there's a really interesting debate to have here. Um, anybody who's out there that w- listens to our show who ha- has lost a loved one due to this, um, that's a much different perspective sure. than, than a lot of other people will be able to have on this because then it becomes a much more personal element to, to, to you. Um, there's just so many different questions here as things start to reopen. Haircuts, restaurants... I don't see a difference in going to a restaurant inside versus going to a movie theater. So mm-hmm. though, so unless you're going to say no restaurants can, can open inside until a certain time, I feel like movie theaters should be in that same boat. I mean, do you guys think I'm crazy for saying that? Or no, I think that's a hundred percent fair. But the other yeah. event that, that feels like not safe to me um, is a sporting event. I wouldn't go to a sporting event because it seems like too many. It'd be harder yeah. to, to police where people sit. Uh, at a sporting event than it would be a movie theater. All right. So let me ask you this. So Sean, let's say, uh, let's say you and, and Michelle and the kids are going to go see tenant on uh, July 18th, Saturday afternoon yes. at your local movie theater. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm assuming that these, so I, I love the way you used the word manipulate earlier. Theaters have the ability to make this work based on see the guidelines that we're, we're, we're seeing. We've yeah. seen guidelines that say limit your screens to 25%, etc. <laughs> seats in between. Those are all things that people can actually do and achieve in the theater. Um, So the theaters have the ability to actually police this their own Mm -hmm. and they and they will because, you know, they want to open and they will make it the the, do. But I went and got my haircut. When I walked up to the guy, he already had a sanitizer waiting for me, Mm -hmm. sprayed my hands, cleaned all of his materials in front of my face to make sure I knew they were clean and then I felt completely safe. If I walk into a movie theater and I know that they are following the legal guidelines. And so my question to you is, Sean, if you want to go four people mm-hmm. to a movie theater, how do you tell the ticket system mm. that you're a family that you want to sit four together? Interesting. And not sit apart. So I'm wondering if that's going to be a thing where it'll give you an option to say, OK, if you're with this person, you're comfortable to sit next to them. Right. We'll allow you the four seats together. Then we're going to space you apart between six other seats or something like that. I don't or know how they're going to do that. Even if you went as a group, like when if, right. like a couple of a group of couples that wanted to go see whatever the new movie was. I'm, that's but, a great question. I'm not sure. And to simply answer the question before we move on. Yes, I would go to the movies today. You guys know my feelings on it. But there's you know, there's an element there where everybody has their own story about how they've been affected by this. And you may or may not feel that it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. I just feel like we are in a time period where we have to, we're, we're learning how to adjust to our situation. And it's a terrible situation, but we're trying to find ways to adjust to keep our, the lives going and haircuts and all these places that are opening. Yeah. I think movie theaters deserve to be within that reopening phase. And I, did, I in no way do I want this to sound insensitive, but there's no perfect time to open any of these, Mm-mm. these situations. And I'm exactly, a, I just fear the, I feel the businesses need to sort of rip the band-aids off and almost learn a little bit how to correct things as they go. But it's amazing. I just want to point this out and then we'll move on. Um, where we are now versus a month ago, you know, where a month ago yes. we probably said there's no way in hell we held on to tenant as much as we could. But, but a we, haircut a month ago sounds insane. Yeah. That and sounds insane to me, but I went out and got one and it was fine. Jake, you're going to look amazing. Yeah. Look how good Kevin looks. My God. Yeah. Oh, oh, don't yes. rap us, Gabe. <laughs> we're talking about how good Jake's going to look. All right. So yeah. we all agree. It's going to, you think that's going to open? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm convinced. I do. I'm July convinced 17th, Tenet will be in theaters. Yes. I think Wait, so. what happens to Unhinged? I saw a trailer for Unhinged last night. It's still coming out July 1st in theaters. I, Kevin, what do you mean what happens to Unhinged? It's bringing people back to the theater. It's Thank saving you. cinema. Yes, it's saving That's cinema. what happens to Unhinged. Thank you, Russell Crowe. All right, uh, yeah. before we head back to theaters uh, in June or July, in late June or early July, we're talking about things that we are streaming. Um I want to touch on a television show that's on Apple TV Plus called Defending Jacob, which is now finished. 
and you guys can uh, stream it in its entirety. This is one of those shows that did parcel itself out uh, one a week, which I am finding myself much more in favor of. Is it eight episodes? Is that how many it was total? Um, Really a terrific show. Uh, The cast so solid across the board. Chris Evans is essentially the lead. Uh, Jaden Martell. Is that his last name? Jaden Martell, uh, who people might know from it. Uh, played the son essentially it's a a teenage boy yeah from the the lodge as well too a teenage boy who is accused of murdering a classmate uh from his high school you learn that he's been bullied uh it talks a lot about social media but i thought it did an incredible job of really portraying uh warts and all how difficult it would be for a family in a suburban community uh to have their child suspected of murder uh it does it didn't pull any punches i didn't think uh with with diving into sometimes to uncomfortable lengths what this family would go through of being judged by uh by the other people around them how the family was affected how the kid is affected um and then a late uh addition to the cast is uh jk simmons and i I, i'm not gonna talk about who he plays i'll leave that out there for people too because it's a it's a it's a really, I thought, compelling and and extremely well done series that you might not want to binge. Um, it's not the type of episode that you just plow right through, uh, but it made us think, and maybe because we have a teenage kid, and maybe it, you know affected Michelle and I on a different level. But it was really compelling, and I thought Chris Evans did an amazing yeah. job, uh, particularly with his acting. You know, it's not showy at all. It's very understated the way that he performed the the role because uh, Evans is, Evans is the father of the kid, but he's also a lead. Um, defender in the uh, he's a lawyer in this assistant district attorney right he uh, that's right that's right assistant district attorney and um he gets removed from the case and then essentially has to participate and fight for his son's uh innocence but then jakey did you read the book before this became a show or no i i I never read the book i was just genuinely curious um because i'd never heard of it until the series came out okay and really, honestly, it wasn't until halfway through the series that I even realized it was a book um, because Kevin and I both got to interview uh, J.K. Simmons. So I was doing some, some homework on it. Um, but I was just curious and looked up what the ending was to the book compared to and, and how similar or dissimilar it was. Um, I, Sean, I texted you what the differences were. Mm-hmm. I prefer the the book ending. Um, it's, it's very similar with a, with a couple of, of, of pretty, pretty big tweaks. Um, but, um, I prefer the book, but I, but I'm curious, Sean, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, as, as the, the sole parent on, which I feel like we do that a lot on the show as a sole parent on this show, and this is maybe arguably a spoiler. So if you don't want to watch it, jump forward 90 seconds in the show, I'm giving you a moment. Okay. There we go. All right. So the concept of, uh, the mother beginning to wonder herself. Yeah. If her son actually committed the murder. Yeah. Is that feasible to you? Like the, the concept? I mean, imagine like it's it's one of your sons. Yeah. And you're presented with the evidence that she is presented with. Yeah. Would you could could you have that moment where you go like maybe? Yeah. That's terrifying. Oh, that's oh, that just, that just like yeah. hit me in the gut. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I'm telling you, Michelle and I had that conversation. Not, really? about, not about our own kids, because I think yeah. both of our kids are fairly balanced. Yeah. Um, well, they thought we, theirs was, too. But we really did have a conversation of just like. Can you imagine if if you ever got to a point where the evidence mounted so much where you had to, we said this, where we had to look at each other and be like, do you think that there's a possibility that this might have happened this way? And it's that's why I really commend the show for not being afraid to to ask those questions and to put those characters in some of those really difficult situations. So I I thought it did a great job of doing that. Kevin, Kevin, you watched it too, right? Kevin, you can come back. You can come back. Oh, did he? He, he, did, he his, did the video. He took oh, his, yeah. What's that? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yes, you can, you can put him back in. Sorry. Now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, did not, I didn't know you took your headphones out. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I you watched it, dude. Didn't you? I thought you watched it. Not the ending. I haven't seen oh, the ending. Cool. Oh, cool. Okay. You got to watch the ending. Stay with yeah. it, dude. It's really good. Yeah. Um, so, and Jake do they wants defend, to Do they defend him properly? Well, we can't give that away. Oh, okay, okay, okay. His name's not Jacob. That's the twist. Oh. Oh, it's Jake. Okay, okay. It's Jake. <laughs> uh, Jake, you are starting a, a classic television show. I want you to reveal that for the audience. Yeah, I just watched last night. I watched the pilot. And then today I was able to squeak in the second episode of The Wire, which is one of those shows that, you know, when, when you look at a list of the top TV shows of all time, more often than not, it's at number one. Yeah, there you go. Um, I gave it a shot years ago. 
Um, a buddy of mine bought it for the first season for me on DVD for my birthday. I think I was like 18 at the time. Mm. And I remember the first thing I remember when I pressed play was, is this in four by three? Because I guess like HBO hadn't like remastered it to be fit for a widescreen TV yet. OK. And so I think that like already was like a punch in the of like a like, look how, how, look how dated this TV show looks. And then like. Yes, the technology is like like I can't tell you how often someone's like I need to get a hold of this person. And the guy's like, "Well, I paged them." Like like how often like they're yeah, just like yeah. the technology. But that being said, I and you know, that was god, it's crazy to think that me being 18 was 14 years ago. But let, let's let's chalk that up to like 14, 15 years ago. Uh, just having watched the, the the two episodes that I've watched, already more so I can tell I'm I'm finding myself sucked into it. Um, real, I, I've heard something and I don't, I'm, I'm always afraid to like dive too much to get the answer, but that like every season has a different theme or something like, like people refer to season one as like the, this season. And then season two is like the, this isn't there. There's like a newspaper season or something like, like a media. I don't that's know. A, that's a hundred percent what happens. So, so, but, uh, but, so are they different stories or like, what's the deal? They, they'll still keep a lot of the, uh, core characters. They all yeah. sort of translate, whether it's Idris Elba as a uh, stringer bell uh, Dominic West and Jimmy McNulty, his his cop, uh, they're all part of it, but it grows. And I, I was trying to say to you, like, season one is really great, but season one sort of lays the groundwork of of here's who everybody kind of is. Yeah. And then each season expands the scope of the show. So season two takes place primarily at the um, at the docks and it gets into a lot of stuff that's smuggled into Baltimore. Season three, I want to say three or four. One of them has one of the most brilliant concepts and I won't tell you anything um, in, in great detail, but it introduces the concept of, of something called Amsterdam, which is if we set up a, a zone in Baltimore where the drug trade is allowed um, and the police won't interfere with it, we're going to let it happen. Um, will that clean up the areas of the city that are out of the zone? Has anyone ever tried that? I think. Well, I think it's called Amsterdam because maybe Amsterdam has that. I guess, it's, like, I guess like in where, like, where it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been yeah. a while since I saw the episode, but I just That's remember. so interesting. And, and the sad thing is that it works. <laughs> it really works. And then politicians come in and they're like, we can't have this because what if you live too close to the Amsterdam area? Um, but so much of the wire is about how drugs are traded on the corners uh, all throughout Baltimore and how it affects daily life whether you're in the drug trade or not right because you can't escape it because it's it's right on your corner or it's right in the neighborhood where you're trying to do the right thing but it, it's so close to you and this one police officer or this one police commissioner comes up with this idea of like isolating it and then it does it it cleans up all the neighborhoods around it so it's it's an incredibly smart show and you're right every season gets into a bigger story but it will involve most of the same characters that you that you grow to love so cool. i'm so glad you're watching it and it's yeah. amazing so awesome if you guys haven't watched it please start watching it or watch it with us we're going to be commenting on social media uh this week in movies there's so many things coming briefly just want to touch on the fact that ryan johnson's film knives out is going to be available on Amazon Prime uh, starting on June 12th. So if you have not seen that film or if you want to catch up with it, that's where you can start streaming it. Uh, I'm going to touch on Artemis Fowl. Um, Wait, also, our interview with Ryan Johnson is available as well. Um, and Jamie Lee you, Curtis. And Jamie Lee Curtis. We had Ryan Johnson and Jamie Lee Curtis both on for Knives Out. Just go back in our old catalog. You'll find the interviews. Absolutely. Great conversations. Um, Artemis Fowl is coming to Disney+. Plus. Uh, Jake, you did not see it? Nah. Kevin, you watched some of it? Yeah, I haven't had a chance to finish it yet. <laughs> okay, so I'll talk about it real quick. Um, it's not good. And I I really, I hate, I honestly hate doing this. I had it. something personal going on. That's why I couldn't finish it. But sure. yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Well, listen, you were spared. Um, yeah. It's just, it was coming to theaters. Obviously, with theaters being closed, Disney moved it to Disney+. Plus. We've had this conversation on the show before of um, the movies that they choose to send to streaming. <laughs> Uh, if they almost kind of know that they're not going to do well in theaters anyway, like you don't see Wonder Woman 84 going to paid VOD uh, and you don't see Tenet going to paid VOD. But I understand now why Artemis Fowl went. And I'm really I'm going to chalk it up ultimately to Kenneth Branagh just being the wrong fit for the material uh, because he's obviously he's an incredibly gifted filmmaker. Obviously, he's an amazing actor. Um, this is kid material and it's it's fantasy material. It's, it's derived from a very popular series of books. I did not read them. 
it's very possible that the people who love the books will find something to appreciate in this material, but it just feels like every aspect of it was ripped off from something else. It's it's Spy Kids meets Fantastic Beasts meets uh, 007, you know, with um, or Agent Cody Banks, which is like nothing in it felt original. And it's all just these mishmash of stuff. But it's one of those things where the two leads, the two kid leads are good. I, I thought they were good in the roles that they played. But then there's a series of, you know, Josh Gad is in it and he's playing a dwarf who uh, tunnels through things like a like a mole uh, or a gopher. Uh, Judy Dench shows up later on as like the head of the Elfin Police Department, and they just look embarrassed to be there. You know, like Judy Dench shows up and she's not having fun, and I don't know why she's in it. And it's just I, the whole thing's sounds kind like of a, cats. It's oh god, she is in that too, isn't she? Who is her agent? Her agent needs to be fired because she's she's above all of this stuff. And I don't get why she's doing this stuff. So uh, even if you have Disney Plus, the problem is, I think it's I think the mythology is a little bit too confusing for little kids. And I think that the execution is a little bit too amateurish for older kids. So I don't know who this is for. So Artemis Fowl <laughs> coming. To there Disney you Plus. go. Thank you for coming on the show, Sir Kenneth. You were an amazing interview. <laughs> Um, but we look forward to uh, Death on the Nile coming out in theaters later, <laughs> later this year. We're definitely not getting him for that. King of Staten Island is coming to VOD. Now, this is a this is a movie where and Jake, you've said this while you were talking to us about it. You do sort of wish you had a chance to see it in a theater. Yeah, um, you know, we all got screener links for it, obviously, and we're able to see it ahead of time. And the whole time I'm watching, I'm just thinking like. God, I, I really like this, but I, this I, it was maybe one of the first I don't want to say like big, but first notable movies that uh, I was seeing being forced to see mm-hmm. on my TV screen rather than seeing in a theater. Like there are some that we just had the opportunity to. And it's like, OK, that, but and, and Defy Bloods being the other. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. I, and, and in fact, I think I don't want to say like because I, I love the movie a lot. I just think I would have liked it a lot more if I could have seen it and sort of just been entranced with it. Um, and this is such like a weird thing, but like. So just by nature of like the time change, my apartment doesn't get dark till like 830. And I've got to go to bed in the ballpark just because by nature of like when I get up in the morning, I've got to go to bed somewhere between nine and 10 to get, you know, some sleep. So I've got to start these movies usually around 637 if I'm going Mm -hmm. to watch them and get them done. And, and, you know, and and Judd Apatow movies are like 18 hours long a piece. So I knew that like, so, so like I'm, I'm watching this movie that I really want to see that's incredibly um, emotional and has these great powerful moments, even though it is a comedy, or maybe a, a, a more of a drama that has comedy moments. And I'm watching it in a room that's sun, that's full of sunlight. And it's just like, this is not the way this movie was meant to be seen. And it goes back to our love of theatrical experience. That being said, amazing performances. I think one of Apatow's best scripts. Um, I think, uh, I mean, if you had told me six months ago that, you're, that one day I would think that Pete, Pete Davidson would be deserving of an Oscar nomination. Uh, I, I think I thought he was absolutely incredible. You can get into the logistics of like how much, how many points do you get if you're really playing a variation of yourself. But I, I really, I thought he was incredible. Um, it was a lot more affecting than I thought it was going to be. Um, and it, it, it really taps into something that Apatow is great at, which is finding comedy in dramatic moments. I think you can make just as much of an argument that he's a great dramatic director who just happens to be able to find humor in those dramatic moments, which I, th- which I think is something he doesn't get enough credit for because I actually think that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that this might be his best, the best example of him doing it. Yeah, I mean, Apatow, it's interesting you say that last thing you said, Jake, because I feel this. I feel Apatow is one of the greatest filmmakers working in our generation, but because he works in comedies, He's not really considered in that in that uh, upper echelon of like Nolan's and Tarantino's. But like what Jake just said is exactly why Apatow is so brilliant. I don't I mean, listen, I'm not sorry. I'm not trying to say one's better than the other. I don't think no one could do this type of filmmaking. I don't think Tarantino could do this type of filmmaking. I think that everybody has. I mean, Tarantino blends together comedy and drama pretty well. But I think Apatow has a very, very, very talented eye. For direction and for filmmaking. Bob Ellswood shot this movie. It's one of the best cinematographers of all time. I mean, this is shot on 35 millimeter. <clears throat> I think Apatow is actually making comedies like, excuse me, I'm like, I'm choking on my own. Uh, You're really broken up is, over Pete yeah, Davidson. This movie, this movie got caught oh, really emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! 
No, it actually is really, really sad. Um, but the film itself, I, I just find that Apatow is working on a level that is above what comedies normally get from directors. I feel like a lot of comedies sometimes can be shot digitally. The shot compositions don't really matter. It's all about the raunch factor and trying to get the the laugh at the moment. But none of that has like real staying power. There are a lot of great comedies out there that fit into this category that I'm referring to. I just think Apatow is one of the best working today that is not recognized. I almost feel like it's the same thing about Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is one of the best actors working today, but he, because he's so famous People forget how great he is. And obviously he won for once upon a time in Hollywood. I just think there are factors that go into people's minds that have certain bias elements. When you look at a filmmaker or look at a film like you. Oh, I can't look at Knocked Up and think that's great cinema. That's that's an R rated raunchy comedy with like weed jokes and things like that. You know what I mean? And I, I find that to be. I find that to be a, a bit disrespectful to the craft of what Apatow actually puts on screen. You know, I, re- I just rewatched 40 year old virgin. Every joke still lands in regards to it's timeless. I mean, there are things in his movies that definitely would not be able to be said today for sure. Wait a second. Um, yes. Really quick, quick sidebar. You just rewatched all the Judd Apatow movies. Yes. Don't they spoil Lost and This is 40? They do. They do spoil <laughs> Lost. So it's funny. I actually, I actually, no, I actually walked away from that. Okay. Um, during that moment, the moment Jake's referring to is, I think it's Maude Apatow's character yeah. who is watching Lost and then they take away Lost from her for the last two episodes and don't let her finish it. Yeah. And she's like super mad. Um, and then they show, I think they show, I, I've seen the final, that, that shot of like yeah. Jack and yeah. But, but honestly, I find Apatow to be an incredible storyteller. And at the end of the day, it's these moments. There's a scene in King of Staten Island and I'll, it's in the trailer and I'll mention it where Steve Buscemi essentially says to Pete Davidson, who who has felt his entire life after his Pete Davidson's dad really died in 9-11. He, he, he died in during 9-11 and so he was a firefighter. So in the film, they change it a little bit. In this case, his father died in a in a uh, was it a hotel fire? Mm-hmm. I think in this particular film. Also, Pete's not on SNL. His name is Scott in the film, which was also his dad's real name. Mm-hmm. So what's interesting about it is the there's a sequence in the film where they talk about Pete maybe becoming a firefighter, and he looks at the firefighters of the baseball game, and he goes, "Essentially, you guys are selfish. Yeah, you know, how can you do this job and still have families? That's not right because you're leaving families behind. That's what his thinking is because he's upset that his dad passed, and that idea that Buscemi says to him." And he says, your dad was a hero. Heroes are necessary and heroes deserve families. That was one of the most beautifully poetic, therapeutic lines I've ever seen delivered in a film that actually held weight to the person who was taking that line in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, Pete Davidson probably has had those exact conversations in his mind, like how dare my dad be a firefighter and then leave his family behind and go on a job that risks his life every day. But then Buscemi just twists that into the most perfect perspective. Why can't your dad be a hero and have a family? What, why can't, why can't he? And I just found that to be such amazing, amazing, amazing turnaround for me to watch and to see Pete take that line, but also Scott, the character, take that line. And I think that's why the movie works so well is because everything that happens dramatically in that film, I take it as Pete also having a cathartic experience and the character having a cathartic experience. I truly think that Scott, the character he plays in the film, I think he's playing his dad and then giving his dad that 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 moment and i think pete's actually living in his dad's shoes i think that's what's happening in the film that's my personal opinion but i loved it loved it i'm gonna Bill push Burr. back a little bit on apatow uh for this reason there's something about him that not that it bugs me but i find this to be curious and i i we pushed really hard to get him on the show and we came close but he had a ton of press opportunities and he wasn't able to join us but i wanted to have this conversation with him we talk a lot about filmmakers who make specific films um, that they shepherd from start to finish. Nolan, you know, uh, Tarantino. Yeah. With Apatow, I think he does amazing character work, um, but I'm not sure he knows the story of these characters really well. Mm. Uh, and I'll, I'll go over just his last few, and I, I want to sort of put him in this perspective and then see if you guys agree. I don't think Judd Apatow you know, came to the project of, you know, I'm going to make the King of Staten Island because I want to tell that story. I think he found Pete Davidson, you know, and he was kind of cool, though, that he sure. You don't, oh, you don't love that. OK, well, okay that's, but, and same thing with Amy Schumer. Right. Like, I don't think he wanted I don't think he came up with the idea of Trainwreck 
and was like, I want to tell this story about this. Per-. I think he came across Amy Schumer and was just like, oh, what's your story? And they they fashion it into something. So I think he's way more interested in in characters, you know, and the ideas mm. of who these people are. Then then Tarantino says, like, I'm going to make a story about these actors, you know, these characters in this time frame. And I don't care who I get. I'm hellbent on it. Apatow seems to approach it really differently. He finds the people he wants to collaborate with, and then they sort of find the story as they go. And I think a lot of that contributes to like jo- uh, Jake makes a joke about his movies being too long. I think if he if he approached a movie like he did earlier in his early days with uh, 40 year old virgin and knocked up. I think he knew the beginning and the ending of, of each of those stories, right? They were stories that he really wanted to tell. Now he's in a point where he finds really interesting characters or collaborators that he wants to work with. And I think he finds his way through them. And so sometimes I just feel like it takes a long time to get to where he's going. There's there's stuff in the beginning of King of Staten Island that I think you can get rid of because I don't think that he needed it quite so much, you know, and like. One of it is the scene. It's like the, the the pharmacy robbery, right? Like it's probably a scene you could take out, you know, and you can move it on. But it has good character work in it. And But I'm not sure if it moves the story forward. And I don't know. I just find that his approach I, is fascinating that way. I, I think Apatow's storytelling is just real life. I mean, if you think about how how much everything is grounded. So Trainwreck is involving the NBA, which which is fascinating. But Lauren pointed this out. Think about all the different areas of life that Apatow has touched on in his mm. movies. So 40 year old virgin that really kind of goes into the idea of waiting for love and elements like that. What's more important in your life, a sexual attraction and love and things like that. There's so many details and metaphors you can go into knocked up. You know, that plays into like the E news realm of the world. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Catherine Heigl's on E news. Ryan Seacrest is in the film. I feel like what he's doing is he's taking these characters that are that are exist in real life and then placing them in our real life situations as character character versions of themselves. Mm. And I find that to be super interesting. Like it's funny to me, like train wreck. I thought LeBron James and the whole NBA bit, like the fact that Judd Apatow got that to work, that got LeBron to act as great as he did in that film, but also that entire arc at the end with the Knicks and the dancing. I just think that he takes on genres and things that I think are so hard to translate to film Mm -hmm. and then makes them work within the story. He is really kind of playing with this idea of real life and and fiction in a very interesting way. And I don't think he's like, unless I'm not saying he's Tarantino or Nolan in that realm. I just think he's a great director Mm -hmm. that deserves to be talked about in the great director discussion. Let's get to another great director, and that's Spike Lee. Um, Defy Bloods is coming to Netflix on June 12th, and... Me, personally, I'm telling you to watch that movie first. It's my first five-star review of the year. It's going to be remembered by me as one of the best films I've seen this year. Uh, You know, you almost take for granted that Spike's going to make a really great film. And it's not that he always does. I mean, he, you know, he has a couple of films that don't that don't hit or the message is a little bit stronger than the story. This one, to me, ticks every box that I think Spike can bring. Uh, Outstanding performances. He finds a way in in the way that he did in films like Black Klansman, like the way he did in Malcolm X, to connect things that happened in the past to things that are very, very relevant today. Uh, It is a Vietnam War story uh, to a certain extent and how men were affected by going over to fight in this war and how it still hangs over them. It has a bit of a treasure hunt element to it, which is very suspenseful and leads to some really big surprises. Um, And it it allows this. I think his ensemble is incredible. I think everybody in it is incredible. uh, And it allows these guys to really occupy some really complicated characters. uh, And they discuss things that they're still going through today to this day. And, And it's amazing that there are scenes that Spike included in this movie that he shot months ago that are even more relevant today because of uh, current events. And I asked him specifically about one or two of the scenes. And he was like, no, we filmed those months ago. They're just they just happen to be even more relevant today. Uh, You know, we were talking you guys were saying Pete Davidson deserves an Oscar consideration. I think Delroy Lindo, if he's not in the Oscar conversation by the end of the year, then that means we've had an incredible year from this point on. But um, I I think it's brilliant. Would he be uh, lead or supporting? He'd be leading. I think lead. I do yeah. think lead, um, but I loved it. I, I gave it five stars. I, I think you guys liked it as much, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely loved it. You know, we, I feel like we talk, we, we, we use this description for, for Scorsese a lot, and I think we could easily use it for Spike, where it's just like, 
they're getting older, but their movies are are more alive and mm-hmm. more vibrant. I'm not quite sure how old Spike is. It's what I'd imagine late fifties, maybe early. But I think like, he's fifty nine, maybe. But okay. he's been he's been a working filmmaker for a long oh. time, and I yes. mean, and and this movie is made with the life and the energy of like a new 20 year old filmmaker. Like just, just the, the precision, everything about this film is unbelievable. And, and the, 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 the stylistic choices, I feel like what's awesome. Great too, is there are aspects of Spike Lee's work that we know are definitively Spike Lee. Mm. And it's easy to sort of fall into, I'd imagine would be easy to fall in those trappings of like, all right, this is, this is my style. This is what I do. Like, you know, people, people like, or they don't like it, but why, but I've been finding myself still surprised by him he keeps experimenting with things and doing things and even and 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 kevin you pointed this out before i had the chance to see it and i'm glad you did because it really brought my attention to it the shifting aspect ratio like the fact you know and kind of how it morphs from one into the other like just there's so many things but and then also there are fun little moments of that are flashbacks to my favorite Spike Lee things that they, they aren't like beat you over the head with like, Hey, this is that thing that I do. I, th- mm. I think sometimes like I did like the, the, the Spike Lee shot, which I know is not like the spike, but like that, you know, the, yeah. that, that, that takes me out where I go like, okay, there's, there's a Spike Lee thing. But the one sure. thing he does do that I love is the, the monologues to the cameras mm-hmm. because I forget how often, you know, having, I just told you, I just rewatched a, a lot of his movies. I forget how that, that is, a, that's just as much a staple of his movies Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, whether it's do the right thing or 25th hour, they all have those, you know, and Del Rey Lindo has such an amazing one. Like, oh, mm. uh, if that's not his Oscar clip, I don't know what it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I absolutely adore this movie. I there's can I mention one boiler spoiler, potentially spoilery knock that that okay, fast forward 60 know. seconds, 60 seconds or potentially Gabe cut this out <laughs> if you need to. Yeah, I, I mean, the film is like it's one of those films where it's it combines the technical and the emotional into a perfect blend of cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's hey. using hey. Yeah, yeah, there you go. a cinema uh, blend, cinema blend. But, he, <laughs> but but the beauty of what I mean by that is he's utilizing filmmaking tools like aspect ratio shifts, like different types of film stock to immerse you in the world you're in. If you actually, I mean, the aspect ratios in this movie are interesting. Everything in the jungle pretty much takes up your entire full frame of your television, except for a little slither of black and black bars, the top and the bottom. Then you have the normal, I think the two, three, nine, the normal widescreen ratio, which is shot on 35 millimeter. Then you have all the archival stuff essentially in four by three. Then you have the flashbacks to Vietnam, which looks like it was shot on some kind of super 16 millimeter where the present day actors are playing themselves in present day while in Vietnam flashbacks. And I think one of the brilliant things about that and people don't know what I'm referring to. So in the film, it it tracks these four characters who, who go back to Vietnam, they're veterans. And they go back to find the remains of their squad leader, as Sean was mentioning, and also a treasure hunt for some gold. And the actors themselves who are in 2020, the present day actors are the ones you are seeing in the Vietnam footage yep. that shot like it almost like Super 16. And it's an interesting thing. I was talking to one of the uh, with some of the cast about the film. But one of the things I found interesting about it was it's almost like it's a P- it's a PTSD element mm-hmm. because the characters are reliving the horrors of war but as their present selves. So that shows you that years later, decades later, the war is still affecting them in their present day selves. They're just reliving it as their older selves, which I thought was just a brilliant idea. They also saved a bunch of money on de-aging. Can you guys Um, think of another movie that used contemporary actors and just had them do their flashbacks? Because I I was writing the review for The Five Bloods and I couldn't think of another example. But but it's... I can't think of one. It's an interesting tool for immersion because you're with the characters the whole time. So sometimes like and Spike made a great point about this. He said that when you go back to younger characters, sometimes your brain doesn't connect and you get taken out of the movie and you go, oh, that's the younger version of Isaiah Whitlock Jr. And it's interesting. Because you also have to spend a certain amount of time trying to figure out, wait, which actor is, is, is attached to which, you know. And they keep Chadwick young because Chadwick's yeah. the character who died. And that's I find that to be. And then Jake's talking about the the fourth wall break. I mean, the, the, the one in 25th hour against the um, mirror in the bathroom when he's when he's talking to himself. The F you scene. And then the do the right thing. All the different mm. uh, people saying those horrible things to the camera. 
And so when Delroy does his fourth wall break, it, it it's one of those things where, yeah, you can go, oh, that's a Spike Lee moment. But the way that basically Delroy takes you by the neck and just talks to you personally. Mm. I mean, it is an unreal piece of cinema where you're just like you are so in his world. You are you are the camera in the jungle with him watching him. And I found that to be so effective. The double dolly, the shot that Jake's referring to where the characters are floating. Um, you know, some of the best shots ever inside man. Uh, Black Klansman has a great one at the end. I love that shot, but it's always has to be done for the right reason. Uh, do the right thing, I guess. But I mean, one of those weird things about that shot is it's supposed to create a certain level of euphoria and or anxiety as to what the story is projecting on that character. In this movie, he does a very quick one. Did you see mm -hmm. how fast the double dolly was in this one? Mm -hmm. um, so keep an eye out for it. It's a very fast one. I won't say what it is. It's towards Will the end. Will you text end. me after the show? Because I don't remember seeing it. I was. Oh, it's okay. literally towards the end. It's right at the end of the film. It happens for maybe two seconds. Some of oh, his most famous. Oh, yeah, I know what it is. I know what it is. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, know I mean, the is. Malcolm X one's probably the most famous of his usage. I think he's walking down the street and he's just floating mm -hmm. down the street. I mean, it, and, it's, and there's, it's two people in this one, right? Yes. In this one, it's two yeah, people. Yeah. yeah. So look for the double dolly. It's a very famous shot. Very cool shot. Spike will tell you he didn't invent the shot, but it's kind of like his signature. But when I say it's a technical and emotional achievement, he uses the technical aspect ratio shifts to immerse you into the environment of where you are. Jungle has a certain ratio. Uh, they have a certain ratio in their present day. They have their own ratio in the flashbacks. The archival footage has their own ratio. It's kind of cool. It's it, And this is not new. Budapest Hotel did multiple aspect ratios. Waves did multiple aspect ratios. But n I don't think I've ever seen it to the extent like this where it actually shifts before your eyes versus just a cut. I know that Francis Lawrence did some of that with the expanding of IMAX and catching fire, but I have never seen it. The, the, the aspect ratio shifts are just as much of a character as the movie itself. It really works. And I want to just uh, really quickly before we go to the bun game is uh, rave about Terrence Blanchard's score. It's some of the best work oh, that he's ever done. Um, it's truly, I mean, he and Spike have collaborated for years, but this is an incredible score. And, and he mixes the soundtrack really well with it, too. It's like yeah. they're, they both work in perfect sync. Usually you have movies that are either soundtrack heavy or score heavy. This one nails both. Yes. I mean, he is just firing on all cylinders in this movie. Watch it. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's get to the blend game because um, we still have a little bit of show to get through here. Uh, we are playing hashtag twist blend. Uh, it's plot twist, but we decided to take that out. And we want to celebrate some of our favorite twists in movies and I am going to say that uh, Kevin gets to go first. Kevin, hit us with your absolute favorite. Hit us with the best movie shot. Movie twist. It's, it's, it's kind of cheating because like this, uh, mine is very uh, a, a factor of where I am emotionally at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, so recently, Lauren and I rewatched uh, Arrival about two weeks ago. Yes. Which is now that I'm like thinking about there's been so many coincidences that have happened recently in my life. And um, basically our, our, our dog, we had to say goodbye to our dog recently, Oscar. Um, and it was really hard. And it's one of those weird things where so many things have been happening in my life coincidentally before his passing and now after his passing that just feel like there's a strange connection somehow or there's certain things at work that I don't really understand fully or comprehend um, and like, you know, I, I said this in my Instagram post, like, the uh, you know, we got the essentially he had a tumor and it was cancerous. And we got the news that he got that, that he had cancer on a call one night. And Oscar hadn't gotten up to come over to the dinner table for a while since he had gotten sick. Mm -hmm. And right when we got the news, he had cancer. Lauren and I were like crying on the couch and he miraculously stood up and came over and just sat with us while we ate dinner for the last time, essentially. And it was like this weird thing because he was always a dog that would beg for food and like sit there and like, you know, would ask for food. It was, I mean, he wasn't there. To, he was there to hang out with us, but he was there to get his scraps, sure. you know, from the table or whatever. And him not coming over to do that was a really weird thing for us, especially for, you know, for the week or so he didn't do it. We were like something, obviously something's wrong. We knew something was wrong. And so that night he comes over and he didn't ask for any food. He just like sat there and watched us eat. It was like this really sweet thing. And I feel like I do feel like there was a meaning behind it. So the reason I bring all that up is because we watched Arrival two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And at the end of Arrival, I think Arrival has this twist that is so it's so deeply moving and mind blowing that I, I've never really wrapped my mind around 
the decision that someone would have to make in that scenario. So mm -hmm. at the end of Arrival, Amy Adams' character essentially through the the circular nonlinear time of the of the story learns that she is going to have a kid that is going to eventually die from cancer. I believe it was cancer. Mm -hmm. And at, and we think that already happened in mm -hmm. the past prior to her getting to the you know, the aliens and, and all that the communication stuff that happens. So she's given a choice, really, right, to still have a child, not tell her loved one that she's having the child with, that this child's going to die at like the age of 12 mm -hmm. with cancer. And she makes a decision in that moment to have the child so she could still spend that time for 12 years or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And she would rather have had that than not had that at all. And then that begs this really interesting, selfish question. Why don't you tell Renner? Does he does, does Renner does Renner deserve to know? Right. Would he have still gone through with it knowing that this is what ha would happen to the daughter? Um, since we're low on time, I'll just wrap it on this. It, it, it's an interesting perspective because it made me think about why we get our pets. Right. So when we get an animal or a dog or a cat, you know, right at the start of that moment that that animal is not going to live past probably 15 years, like, you mm -hmm. know, maximum, you know, certain time frames are different, 12 to 15, 10 to 15. Oscar, we think was 12. Um, but you know that moment, you know that when you buy that dog, that in 15 years, it's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, it, and it could die tragically, it could die in its sleep, but you are aware of that when you make that choice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it just reminded me, I don't know what it was about when we played this game and I thought about it today when Gabe texted me because I hadn't thought about it until Gabe texted me. And I was like, man, I was like, I've been thinking about Arrival a lot. And it's just weird that I watched it two weeks ago, knowing where I am now and Oscar being gone. It's like a very strange thing. And so I guess now if I was Amy Adams and I had that information about my dog, I would still go through with the 12 years of his life even though he's, you know, he's going to come to an end with cancer, I still would rather have had that moment and given him that love and given him that life. So that's kind of where that one came that's from. That's fantastic, so, man. Yeah. That's a great choice wow. for a really great reason. It's just an wow. emotional, at the moment, it's probably my favorite one, only because of where I am. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I awesome. love it. That's great. Wow. Um, mine is, uh, I, I said to, before we started the show that I hate my pick. Um, and I hate it just because it's cliched. I mean, I have to pick the sixth sense. Um, and, and the reason why I put a lot of thought into, uh, cause there's so many twists and sometimes a twist is just a plot reveal that takes the story in it midway through. It takes the story in a different direction than where you were planning. I, I more envy the, the twist that makes you rethink everything you just watched. Uh, and I don't think there's not a lot of movies that, um, have done it as well as a sixth sense. Some, someone mentioned psycho and I think psycho is a really interesting way, but psycho takes the story in a different direction from, from that reveal essentially. Um, and with sixth sense, the minute you saw it, you had to go back and rewatch to see how you missed yeah. it. How did you miss it? You know? And, and it's, it, we say this sometimes with certain movies, it's a different movie when you watch it a second time through mm. and M night Shyamalan in that instance was airtight. You know, it, it's everything is explained. And it and once you realize the truth about Bruce Willis's character, it's all there, you know, and then it's it's so obvious, too, because um, <laughs> you almost feel stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, he admits yeah. he sees like, when, dead when, people. He's, when he's going for the check and his wife grabs the check before him and you, right. you think it is, you know, the fact that she's not speaking to him at the dinner table. And you think it's because she's pissed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she yeah. says, it's like Shutter Island. That's how I thought about Shutter yeah. Island on the second yeah. watch. Yeah. You know, it's just like this. Yeah. This should be obvious. So. um, So, yeah, I, I mean, there's so many other great ones that I could have chosen, but I just would have felt wrong if I didn't go with Sixth Sense. So, Jake, what, Sean, before before Jake goes real quick, uh, what your second viewing? Was it in a theater? Did you go back immediately? Uh, Yes, I did see it in a theater. Uh, opening I wonder, weekend. Uh, so I remember Friday night seeing it with a crowd. And then going back Sunday to see more, more to see how people reacted to it. Yes. I wonder cool. how much repeat business that movie got. It did oh, dude, really well. It was huge. Movie, yeah. when it came up. Rushed. And it was all yeah. just because of the power yeah. of that. Of and it was nice because I feel like there was reveal. a really I remember I was a kid when it came out, but there was this great like community like I'm not going to tell you just go see it like yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. over I remember there being sort of this really fun yeah. like ooh someone hasn't seen it okay like like has anyone told you anything that okay doesn't cool. exist just go see anymore it. yeah no, now people are assholes do, <laughs> we don't do that at all yeah. anymore we ruin everything 
Jakey, you're um, up. Before I say mine, uh, there are a couple that I thought about choosing. The big one being The Empire Strikes Back. Sure. The reason That's the one I would have assumed you yeah. would have chosen. The reason I didn't choose that is because it was never a, uh, it was never a twist for me. I mm. never got to experience that as a surprise. Uh, like I okay. grew up and it was just sort of common knowledge. Same thing with um, like I, I, I grew up and I, I already knew the ending to Usual Suspects. I grew Same. up. I already knew the ending to Psycho. So mm. for me, the massive X factor when it comes to surprise endings is was I surprised by it? And unfortunately, mm. as, great, as great as I understand Empire was. I, I just I was not I was not surprised by it. like I knew it I wish I could have been and which yeah. obviously would have been um, so that being said then mine is also Sixth Sense where I also felt like yeah. it feels so cliche but what I what I love about oh. that ending is it, it makes the movie better yeah hundred percent but without it the movie's still great it's mm-hmm. it's like it is a great That's a movie great point up until the last twenty even even before that it's a great movie mm-hmm. and I am a big but like I think Bruce Willis is one of those actors where like you can tell when he gives a shit and you mm-hmm. can tell when he doesn't. He cares about like, I think that's one of his best performances. He mm-hmm. cares about and Tony Collette was, it was oh. unbelievable in that. Um, I don't know if she did. She get an Oscar. I know Haley Joel Osment got an Oscar nomination. I don't know if Tony Collette. I did. think she did get a nomination. I mean, she, she, rightfully so. That scene with the two of them in the car. It's amazing. Where the where, the, where he's talking about his grandmother yeah. and then the, the bike rider is standing outside. Yeah, it's an incredible film. It's a it's a beautiful film. It's a haunting film. But and, and you're right. Like I love it because you because of that ending, you get two different movies. What did you she say? Movie. She saw you dance. Gra- Mom, yeah. Ma- Grandma wanted to say yeah, she saw she, you dance. She, she were mad that she didn't make it to your ballet recital. Yeah, yeah, she yeah that's to right. Tell wasn't yeah. that the tra- scene? Is wasn't that the trailer? Yeah. Wasn't the trailer like a, the, the the camera just yeah? So the camera is going down. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. well, she oh. said like she he's like oh it, like we're stuck because a, a bike rider. Got, yeah. got hit and 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 he was killed and she's like wait how can you tell and he goes he's standing outside my window yeah, yeah. and it cuts to black oh was god I, more, I want to rewatch it was anyway, i more shocked it, by that or unbreakable's ending blew my mind i think too. my problem with unbreakable is that it is came off of it. the sixth sense and so yep. the, uh, the whole time i was like "Ooh, what like what is the ending What's what is the, the ending that's why um, i think the village is such an effective twist too because by then he was just known as the guy with the twists and yeah. i did not see the ending of the village coming either. neither did i yeah the village is yeah. underrated by the I, way people I, I like really the village but i just wanted there to be monsters i think at the end of the day i'm bummed oh. because i want it to be a monster movie because right, i think that's right. such a great uh, that's such a great world to create a monster movie in and the fact that it's not a monster movie it bugs me anyway, yeah, i'm surprised so, no one chose um benedict cumberbatch playing con i mean don't you guys remember that twist it was what so a shocker i couldn't believe it <laughs> yeah he was con <laughs> all right audience picks uh shelby jones says psycho obviously terrific one uh michael breen says saw i know that that's, that's a, a really good one. popular that's one. a the really good saw. one uh rachel ho drew ludwig and many others said seven all right Seven a twist? Is that a twist? Oh, yeah. Her head in the box is a twist, for yeah, sure. It's a, it's a surprise. I don't know if I call it a twist. And then, then, then you're starting to split hairs. Yeah. A it's a bit. surprise. It's Lauren shocking. Talavera says memento. A memento. Memento counts as a twist, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Laura Eddy says the double. I don't know what the double is. I don't know what that is either. Anyone know what the so, double someone is? Someone had to say usual suspects, right? Laura, tell us what the double is. Um, no, no. Well, I think some people did say Usual Suspects, but they're not listed here. Ryan McQuaid said The Prestige. I thought about The uh, Prestige. Prestige um, is a great one. Pr- prestige is a good twist. More yeah. so the Christian Bale has a twin yeah. than uh, Hugh Jackman's cloning himself, right? Like, I think I think the twist in that movie is is Bale with the, Bale with the yeah. twin. Yeah. We are ruining and, and, a lot of movies. Yeah. Did any, anyone mention <laughs> The Mist? <laughs> No one mentioned the mist. Oh, Nothing misses, I saw. Yeah, a lot of love for Sixth Sense. I feel like a jerk. I used to be. I was that guy who had a. Uh, do you guys remember that sh- that famous shirt that came out with all the famous endings on it? It was oh, like the yeah, shirt. Yeah, yeah. It mm. had like the Sixth Sense and Citizen Kane. It was like Bruce Willis is dead at yeah. the end. Like it was every major film twist. But there are also movies that it's sort of like famous. Okay, yeah. if you don't know this, yeah. but like. Like, you know, I'm sorry. Like, okay. I, they're, they're like, I, I, and this happens. I'm sure it happens with you too, Kevin. Every once in a while on air, I'll say something about like, oh yeah, Bruce Willis being dead at the end of Sixth Sense. And oh, then yeah. inevitably I'll get an email or a phone call that's like, you ruined it for me. I'm like, dude, it's 25 years old, I man. Know. Like, yeah. like statute yeah. of limitations has passed. Yeah. So much. That's what, it's, it's a great point, Jake, about the ones you didn't get to experience. I'm, the, I'm in the same boat as you. I, yeah. All those yeah. movies, because those will never have the same effect that people had. Yeah. All right. You know what I mean? It's interesting. Next week, I think Kevin's uh, farther ahead in his preparation than Jake and I will be, because we are going to play hashtag Judd Apatow blend. 
We're going to talk about mm. our favorite Judd Apatow films and why they are our favorites. And you guys get to play along. Uh, if you want to do it on social media, you can Ooh, use hashtag Judd Apatow Blend. Uh, if you'd like to email us, it's realblend at cinemablend.com. Make sure you check out King of Staten Island before you play, because it might end up becoming uh, your favorite. Uh, I think... Um, it's going to hit a lot of different people a lot of different ways. Reviews. Uh, we have a review this week from Stuntman Dave, who said, or Stuntman David, I'm sorry. Oh, that's cool. That's a cool name. Who says, my new number one favorite podcast. I first heard of the Real Blend podcast while listening to BDK on the Sports Junkies. Kevin's segment on that show was always my favorite, and I am an avid movie lover. After listening to their interview... With Joe and Anthony Russo, I was completely hooked. The guys, including Gabe, have a wonderful chemistry, and you can tell they genuinely love all things film. The interviews they are able to get for the show are really something, and the blend game is a great way for us listeners to be able to share our thoughts on our shared passion for movies. I have one question for you guys, if you're able to squeeze it in. All right, we'll do our best. What movie scene most emotionally impacted you? For me, it's the ending of Endgame or the house fire scene in Manchester by the Sea. Mother of God, that's a kick in the gut, that one. Oh. Uh, if you don't get around to reading this on the show, I totally understand. Keep up the good work. And Dunkirk, P.S. Kill Bill is most certainly one film. Thank you, Stuntman David. Uh, for weighing in on that debate. All right, really fast. Let's go. I know Jake's got to finish up. Jake, do you have an emotional scene? Uh, the the funeral scene in Big Fish when he realizes that his dad actually, to a certain degree, really wasn't lying his entire life. That's amazing. Kevin? Either the uh, beach scene in About Time or mm. the um, or the interstellar scene with Matthew McConaughey. All right, I'm saying the, uh, the reveal in Dear Zachary. And um, well, I want to tell you what the reveal is. And the moment in a monster calls when the kid finally admits he just wants his mother's cancer battle to be over. Oh, my God. I yeah. just got goosebumps thinking now, about that. What about one one that emotionally scarred me when Luke throws the saber over his shoulder in Last Jedi? All right. So you can <laughs> follow us on social media uh, at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV and at Sean underscore O'Connell. Again, reminder, Wait. head over to the Facebook community page and sign up. And what? Yes. What? Really, really yes. quick before we go. Hi. So when, whenever uh, Gabe posts these on YouTube, yes. he always finds like kind of fun, goofy, like screenshots of us to put yeah. like in the thumbnail. Yeah. Can we like all come up with ours right now and have him <laughs> oh, do it? Yeah, sure. Let, okay. Let, ready? Three, hold two. On. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, all Here right. we go. Three, two, one. There you go. Gabe. All right. Got there it. Again. Go. Excellent. That's what we want our thumbnails to be. Uh, <laughs> drop a review on iTunes. Follow us on social media. And we will be back next week with a brand new episode of Real Blend. And until then, Dunkirk. <laughs> Dunkirk? Dunkirk. Dunkirk.